Lady Rose will hand down this judgment. Ponzi schemes have historically been described as robbing Peter to pay Paul. What happens in a Ponzi scheme is that the operator of the scheme persuades people to invest their savings with him, promising them attractive interest rates and a favourable return on their investment when it matures. The investors put in their money, and for a while, they receive what they are told are the interest payments or the dividends that they were expecting. In fact, however, the operator of the scheme does not invest their money at all, and the supposed interest payments or returns he pays to them when their product matures are simply paid out of other money that is being given to him by new people, also thinking that they are investing their savings and also hoping to get a good return. Typically, the operator of the scheme uses some of the money from new investors to keep up the pretense of having invested the earlier customers' monies, and the rest of the money he and his fellow fraudsters spend on living an expensive lifestyle. Eventually, however, rumours start to fly and people become suspicious. No new investors are prepared to hand over their savings, and the existing customers rush to withdraw their funds. Then the scheme collapses and it is revealed that there is no fund and there are no investments. It was all a fraud. This appeal arises from such a scheme. The appellant, Stanford International Bank Limited, is a company that was incorporated in Antigua and Barbuda and is now in liquidation. I shall refer to it as SIB. A large proportion of SIB's business consisted of pretending to sell investment products to international customers. SIB was ultimately controlled and operated by Robert Allen Stanford. Under Mr. Stanford and certain of his close associates, SIB was run as a Ponzi scheme. When customers requested withdrawals of money from SIB, or when a customer's investment product supposedly matured, SIB would pay these customers using funds it was taking in from other customers' capital investments. In 2008, many of SIB's customers requested withdrawals from SIB, fearing that it may become insolvent. In February 2009, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission charged Mr. Stanford in relation to the fraud, and the scheme collapsed. In April 2009, the Antiguan court appointed liquidators over SIB. For his role in this Ponzi scheme, Mr. Stanford is now serving a federal prison sentence in the USA of 110 years. But almost all of the money entrusted to SIB by investors who did not get their money out in time has gone. The well-known bank HSBC operated four bank accounts for SIB during 2003 to 2009. These were the bank accounts into which the money from investors was paid and out of which the payments to customers on the pretended encashment of their in fact non-existent investment products were paid. This appeal relates specifically to payments amounting to £116 million from the HSB accounts to SIB's customers. I will refer to these as the disputed payments. Some of the disputed payments were made directly to SIB's customers, while others were first transferred to SIB's account with a separate bank in Toronto before being sent on to its customers. SIB, through its liquidators, has brought a claim against HSBC. SIB's case is that HSBC had, or ought to have had, reasonable grounds for suspecting that Mr Stanford's instructions to make the disputed payments were all part of a fraudulent Ponzi scheme. Accordingly, SIB alleges that HSBC owed it a duty, known as the Quince Care duty, not to follow Mr Stanford's instructions, and the bank should have refused to make those payments. SIB argues that it was because HSBC failed to comply with this duty that the disputed payments were made to SIB's customers, and therefore SIB has suffered loss. It is accepted that none of the customers and none of the employees working at HSB actually knew that the scheme Mr Stanford was operating was a scam. HSBC applied to the High Court to strike out this claim, but the application was refused. However, on appeal, HSBC was successful. SIB now appeals to the Supreme Court against the Court of Appeals order to strike out this claim. 
The issue that this appeal raises is this. Even if HSBC did owe SIB the Quince Care duty, and even if it was in breach of that duty, did the breach give rise to any recoverable loss by SIB? If there's no recoverable loss, then there's no point in the claim continuing beyond this time. The Supreme Court holds by a majority that the disputed payments do not amount to a recoverable loss because the payments made relieved SIB of £116 million worth of its contractual liabilities to the customers to whom those payments were made. It's helpful first to distinguish between two categories of SIB's customers. First, there were some customers who did not lose their money because they withdrew all the funds that they thought they had invested in SIB prior to its collapse. I will refer to these investors as the early customers. The important point here is that SIB was liable under its contracts with the early customers to pay them the money that it did in fact pay them. So the disputed payments extinguished a contractual liability that SIB undoubtedly owed to the early customers. Second, there are the customers who did not withdraw their funds before SIB's collapse and who now risk losing almost all their money. They have the same contractual entitlements to be paid as the early customers, but instead of being paid in full, they will have to prove their debt in the liquidation and are likely to only get a few cents payment for every dollar that they are owed. I will refer to these investors as the late customers. Under the hypothetical situation where HSBC had not complied with Mr. Stanford's instructions to make the disputed payments, SIB might still have had the £160 million in its bank accounts at the point when it went into liquidation. However, in that scenario, SIB would not already have paid its debts worth £160 million to the early customers before collapsing into insolvency, so it would still be liable under its contracts with them for amounts totalling that sum. The assets of the company would therefore be the same. It would have £116 million more pounds in cash, but it would owe £116 million more pounds in debt to the early customers. It is true that if all those early customers have to prove now in the liquidation, they will only get a few cents on the dollar, let's say five cents, instead of the hundred cents they in fact got. That might make it look as if SIB had saved 95 cents in each dollar because it ends up having to pay the early customers much less. But the majority of the court hold that this saving is really an illusion for two reasons. The first reason is because the insolvency does not extinguish the debt of 95 cents in the dollar that SIB will still owe to the early customers. So again, its net asset position is the same. The second reason is that if SIB has 116 million more pounds to distribute amongst all its creditors, it will just give each of the customers a few more cents in the dollar than it would be able to without that 116 million pounds. So a little more of the late customers' debts will be paid off and the amounts will balance out. For example, in the hypothetical scenario where there is that extra 160 million pounds, the group of customers as a whole would get, say, 12 pence in the pound, rather than the early customers getting the full 100 pence and the late customers only getting 5 pence. So SIB's apparent saving by paying the earlier customers a lower amount in the liquidation is matched by it having to pay the whole group of customers a higher proportional value of their claims. In other words, when SIB is eventually dissolved in the hypothetical scenario or in the real world, the same amount of SIB's overall debt will have been extinguished. SIB is neither in a worse nor a better position from a monetary perspective for having paid the early customers in full. The liquidators argue that it is fairer for all the customers to be treated equally and all to get a little more in the liquidation. And that's fairer, they say, than for the early customers to be paid in full and the late customers to get less than they would do if the £116 million was available. But the Supreme Court, by a majority, holds that the fairness of any particular late or early customer having been paid or not paid is a matter of policy within the applicable insolvency regime. 
earlier proceedings in Sibs Antiguan liquidation had determined that the liquidators cannot now claw back the payments made to the early customers. Accordingly, this is not a matter that this court can investigate or assess. In a concurring judgment, Lord Leggett agrees with the majority that SIB has not suffered loss because of the disputed payments for which it received full value in terms of the extinction of the debt. The disputed payments, he agrees, left SIB's net position unchanged. For reasons that I cannot do justice to in this short summary, Lord Sayles dissents. On his view, SIB has suffered loss. Lord Sayles holds that the diversion of £160 million in the HSBC accounts from the creditors as a whole into the hands of the early customers does represent a loss to SIB. This is the case because at the time of the diversion, SIB was so hopelessly insolvent, and so SIB's own interests as a legal person were fully aligned with those of its general creditors as a whole. But by a majority, therefore, the Supreme Court decides on the assumed facts of this case to dismiss SIB's appeal. SIB has not suffered a loss that has any monetary value to it, and hence the Quince Care Duty claim must be struck out.